When IBM launched the original hard drive in 1956, I bet the engineers didn't imagine that we'd still be using pretty much the same spinning disk technology almost 70 years later. The problem with those spinning rust mechanical drives is that they have a finite lifespan and they don't last forever. And that's a growing headache for retro collectors today, because the pool of working drives keeps shrinking, pushing prices up steadily. Let's do some napkin maths. A 5400 RPM drive running daily for 10 years would have spun about 28 billion times. And if the platter were a wheel, that's nearly 200 trips around the Earth, or almost 14 round trips to the Moon. It's no surprise that these drives eventually fail. So what modern replacements can we use instead? I've talked about the Blue SCSI before. It's a hard drive emulator using SD cards to store disk images and your OS and apps. They're fantastic and packed with extra features, but the name says it all, SCSI. For most vintage PCs, the drives are IDE or even older types like MFM or ESDI, which Blue SCSI can't replicate. Today I want to focus on IDE, the format I know best, right after this message from PCBWay. If you're working on a project and need something made, PCBWay has you covered. It doesn't matter if it's something simple like a few PCBs, a detailed 3D printed model, or even the advanced stuff like CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, or injected moulding plastics, they do it all. What I really like about PCBWay is that they make it super easy to go from an idea to a finished part. You upload your design, pick your options, and they take care of the rest. Their prices are really reasonable, and as somebody who's ordered some of their 3D printed parts myself, I can say the quality is excellent, solid and accurate, exactly what I needed. So if you're thinking about starting a new project, upgrading something, or just experimenting with a new idea, give PCBWay a try. You'll find a link to their website in the description below. And thanks for their continued support of this channel. Cheap IDE to compact flash adapters have been around forever. Compact flash cards support a built-in true IDE mode, which with a simple passive adapter you can plug directly into an IDE port. It's perfect for a retro PC or embedded system, but compatibility and speed depends on the card. I've used many over the years and found them to be quite cost effective. However, running an OS with heavy virtual memory like NT-based systems, Linux or macOS on a compact flash card will wear it out fast and choke on random I.O. Most compact flash controllers lack advanced wear levelling and can't handle the constant small writes generated by paging and swapping. So what else is there? Well, cheap MSATA to IDE adapters have been available for years and that's now my go-to. While compact flash cards are cost effective for smaller capacities, prices rise sharply for larger sizes. MSATA SSDs on the other hand are now super cheap. For vintage computers, 32 or 40 gigabytes may seem like overkill, but they're priced very competitively. I recently snagged a 40 gigabyte Intel drive for my Titanium PowerBook G4 for just $8.99 with free shipping. An SSD in a vintage computer won't blow your socks off speed-wise, as you're still limited by a slow bus, but there are benefits. With the right adapter, you get near instant access times. They are silent and cool during operations, lower power draws, and greater reliability than spinning disks, plus backups and replacements are a breeze. Of course SSDs degrade over time, no tech lasts forever. Now the main focus, an IDE to SD card drive emulator. Much simpler than the blue SCSI, no disk images or fancy features. Just insert an SD card and plug it into your IDE bus and it presents the entire card to your vintage machine. Two great perks is you can use an SD card extension cable to get the card outside your machine for easy swapping, meaning multiple OS's are just a simple card swap away. And if your operating system of choice uses a standard like FAT16, FAT32 or HFS, you can read it on another machine without any special software, it just appears as a normal SD card. That makes transferring data super easy. So let's check one out. This PC already has a compact flash to IDE adapter, so we need to unplug the Berg power cable first, unscrew it from the bracket and then remove the IDE cable. I got this PC locally from Facebook Marketplace for about £20. The seller didn't know what the specs of it were, so it was a fun surprise guessing what I might find. It's nothing fancy, it's a Pentium 2 with 64MB of RAM. I swapped out the graphics card and installed a sound and network card as it didn't come with these. Next we'll plug in the IDE ribbon cable into the SD to IDE adapter. 
put the SD card in and connect it to power. Although this time we'll use a standard Molex, which is the kind you'll see in a hard drive or CD-ROM. The IDE cable is keyed, so you don't have to worry about which way round you put it. I also haven't seen any jumpers anywhere to specify master or slave, so at the moment I'm not quite sure how you configure it. See people, we're learning as we play. The cables inside this machine aren't very long and cable management wasn't even a thing back then, so we'll just have to try and do our best. I need to fashion a mounting bracket for it, so until I can figure something out, I've put some masking tape along the bottom to hopefully prevent anything from shorting whilst it's inside the case. And in true Action Retro style, we'll just smush the adapter inside above the floppy drive and just hope for the best. Out of sight, out of mind. So powering on the PC, we can first of all ignore the gubbins in the top left. That's from my VGA scaler and I don't know how to turn it off. Anyway, we can see the SD to IDE adapter listed as the IDE primary master, but it shows as an SD to compact flash adapter. Now I've read somewhere that this is because it's a clone from the original and this has never been updated. At the next screen we can see the actual size of the card that's in the adapter. To start off with I swapped the 4GB one I put in a few moments ago with a 2GB one and we'll boot the machine. But what OS should we choose? Well my friends of course we're going to try BOS. The installer has a great GUI for partitioning drives and seeing existing partitions. Plus it boots up super quick and you know, it's BOS. What else was I going to use? I came from Mac OS remember, I prefer GUIs. Now this SD card has already got a fat partition on it and drive setup here can see the full size. After partitioning and formatting losses, we can see that there's 1.9 gigabytes available to us. I suppose we should take a look at what it looks like from DOS. I've inserted my Windows 98 boot floppy and we'll boot from there. BOS is far prettier than this, but not everyone shares my enthusiasm about it. A brief synopsis as to what we're doing here. We'll firstly open FDisk and look at the existing partitions. Just as in drive setup, we can see the primary DOS partition of 1938 megabytes. It's FAT16 and takes up the whole of the disk. So we'll delete this partition and create a fresh new FAT32 one and when that's been created, we'll need to reboot the machine and then format the drive. This is all feeling very normal. The PC is oblivious and that's exactly what we want. The way I like to install Windows 98 is to create a folder, C Windows Options Cabs, and then copy the contents of the Win98 folder from the CD to here, and then run the setup. It's an old trick I learned about long ago. It can be a little faster to run setup this way, but it also means that you don't need the Windows 98 CD in future if you're ever tinkering with your system. I've deselected some programs that are installed by default as we don't need them. I've also specified the keyboard layout and the system locale, but that's about it. It's a pretty standard install. Now so far this process hasn't felt any different from running on a mechanical drive with the exception of formatting which is vastly quicker. Copying files over may have felt a bit faster but I'm not sure if this is a placebo effect. Setting up Windows feels exactly the same, but the benefits of using flash media means it's much quieter. You forget how loud these old drives used to be. I wonder how many of you out there remember this setup. The slowest part of this setup was actually the drivers. For some reason I thought the network card was supported out of the box with Windows 98, but it turns out it wasn't. I have the drivers on my FTP server, but that meant installing the network card first, kind of like a chicken or the egg scenario. The driver was larger than a floppy disk, so I was going to put the USB driver on the floppy and then put everything on a memory stick, but then I remembered I could just power off the machine and take the SD card out and put it in my other machine and copy the files over. It sounds so simple, but it's been such a time saver. Other than a network, sound and video driver, oh and DirectX because the stupid graphics card needed it, and WinZip so I could unzip Crystal Disk Mark, that's all that's installed, so here's a boot up speed test. It takes a respectable 30 seconds from powering on the system to get into the desktop with all the drivers loaded, and I've done a bit of customization here as I couldn't help myself. So let's launch Crystal Disk Mark and let it run a series of tests. The only thing I've changed here is the drop down to go from 100 megabytes to 50. I don't really know what it means, but I figured it would take half the time to perform the tests, which I could just about tolerate with my infamous lack of patience. Now on their own, these figures don't look that impressive, and also we've got nothing to compare them against. So I'll test a few cards and share the results. So here are four results, taken with two SD cards, a compact flash card, and a traditional hard drive. I'm not really into disk benchmarking, so I'm just going to go for the bigger is more better approach. 
They all have their pros and cons, but hopefully this will give you an indication of the kinds of speeds you can expect. But please note, they can fluctuate wildly depending on the type of card you use. Older cards are generally slower, so you might be better off putting a newer one in and just partitioning it if needs be. So in conclusion then, what do I think? Should you get one? Well, I'm impressed with the SD to ID's simplicity, but I found an issue where I couldn't get it to work with a CD-ROM on the same channel. The CD-ROM had jumpers on, so I tried setting it to master, slave and cable select. It seems that this device only works if it's the only one on the channel. This may not work out for everyone. I also especially like being able to put an SD card into my computer and copying files backwards and forwards. And okay, yes, when I mentioned this earlier, it had occurred to me that you could put a compact flash card in your computer, but who has a compact flash slot in their laptop these days? SD card readers are way more prevalent. It's just so much more convenient than needing a USB card reader. The only other downside I can think of is how would you mount this? It'll need an adapter and I'll have to figure out a solution. This is probably just me nitpicking at this point, as for the price it's a real non-issue. Talking of price, how much did I pay? Well, it costs just over £10 for mine and if you're interested, I'll leave a link in the description below. So what do you think? Might this be a solution for your vintage computer over the other options I've mentioned? Let me know in the comments below. Well, if you've made it this far, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.